is not only exceeding weight to that glory, but an eternity of glory. And the things now are very temporary. Help us to adjust our perspective. To gain that way of walking that thou hast commanded of us. That attitude. That perspective that enables us to see things in this life from the light of that which is above. So work in us by thy Holy Spirit. That Spirit is what we need. Even again, as the form so often speaks of how he is the agent that thou dost use to accomplish things in us, to work in us that right perspective. And so we pray that will be true tonight too, so that as we focus on thy word, thy word becomes a light for us, a means whereby we are able to gain that right and better perspective as we walk through the valley, but are going home. Sometimes we have many things that we wish we could do first. But teach thou us to wait on thee. Bless us as a congregation. Encourage us. Use the church visitors in this coming week to be a source of strengthening and encouragement and helping to gain perspective for our council. Bless our elders in their work. We thank thee for the good reports that they could give to each other concerning the visits that were made among our homes and among our families. We thank thee for the way that thou hast given unto us in the course of this past year reasons to rejoice, many reasons. There have been difficulties, there have been continued problems, but not without the evidence that thou dost care that thou art leading, that we want things often quicker to be solved and problems to be ended, but thou dost work even through the problems and the difficulties to strengthen us when we wait on thee. So thou dost, so thou dost call us to wait, to wait on thee. And so we strive to do that, Lord. Bless our elders that they may guide us in that. Bless them that they may be faithful in looking out for the souls of all of us, for the spiritual well-being of each one of us. Bless them too as they lead us in the work of evangelism as a congregation. We thank thee for the progress and reports of good developments in the Christianity on campus. We pray that thou will continue to bless that and make that to be a means of of witness to others and a strengthening of our own young people. Give thy blessing to our deacons too. Give them wisdom and humility as they go among us collecting the alms. May they also be wise in the distribution of them. Give them a tender care for all the members of the flock, but especially for those that are in need of the concrete evidence of the mercies of Jesus Christ. Help us all to keep the right perspective as we give and as we receive. And may we be grateful that we are to be stewards of that which thou hast given unto us, remembering that nothing that we have is thy, ours, but it's all thine. Bless our teaching and training of our young people and children. We must be faithful ourselves to maintain the heritage that thou hast given unto us, that we don't take it presumptuously or for granted, that we appreciate the value of the truths that thou hast given unto us. Keep us faithful in maintaining them to know those truths as they're explained and recorded for us in our creeds. We thank thee for our creeds. May they again be not documents that are there in the back of the Psalter that are tucked there and we know they're there, but we don't know what's in them. But may they become living documents expressing those truths that we believe make 
us a part of the true church of Jesus Christ because those doctrines of salvation as recorded there are preached here. May we know that they're preached here. May we know what they are. Bless us so that then when we give them to our children, this is not just something that they have to put into their heads, but that they learn to love those truths because they tell us about Thee. Bless our children that they may know about Thee, but also know Thee. That they may know how loved they are, and that they may love Thee with the love with which they're loved. And that that may be everything to them. That they may give themselves as they face all different kinds of questions in the course of their lives, that they may give themselves to loving Thee. And in loving Thee to live then, as that love would guide them and direct them. Bless us with wisdom to care for these young people, to show them that we do love them and care for them as we strive to reflect Thy love and care. Give them that security. May they not go through any portion of their life wondering or concerned about whether they're loved. Keep them from all sorts of difficulties. We can't. And we know that thou wilt not always do that. That it is exactly through the way of struggles and uh, difficulties and sometimes abuses of various sorts that they have to learn to look up. To thee, the perfect parent, the perfect father. And they may know that they're cared for, if not by earthly father and mother, because as we sang in our first number from Psalm 27, earthly mothers and fathers forsake us, but thou wilt take us up. Thou art the father. And all that which we have on earth is but a picture, but we have the reality by knowing Thee. Work that faith in our children. Bless us as a part of a denomination. We pray for all of the congregations. We pray especially for those that are vacant. We ask Thee to strengthen them, sustain them, enable them to continue to grow spiritually. Be with them that they may be patient, waiting on Thee to give them a pastor of their own. We remember what that was like, and we ask that thou wilt soon give us, soon give to them, each one of them, a pastor, even if it means that thou dost make another congregation vacant. The need for young men to enter into the ministry is extremely great. Gracious Lord, according to thy tenderest mercies, wilt thou work in the hearts of some of our young men here, that they may want to serve the Lord Jesus as a minister of the word, proclaiming the precious gospel. They want to serve the body. They want to be a servant. A servant of servants. Work that in them, that willingness, that desire. Bless the church of Christ everywhere. We know we are a part of a denomination, but we are more a part of a glorious body. Bless that church around the world, especially with the persecuted church. Be with the members that are walking in harm's way or are isolated and alone and incarcerated. Care for all of thy people. Now give us thy blessing as we pay attention to thy word. We worship thee by taking an attitude of wanting to be taught. We beg of thee, teach us, Father, teach us. Just as Jesus taught his disciples, so we pray, teach us. And give us that hearing kind of ear that Samuel had when he prayed, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.
Let's give now for the various causes of God's kingdom. First of all, that of the Reformed Witness Hour. And then secondly, of for the Beacon Lights. Let's sing now from number 363, 363, taken from our text for this evening. Let's sing the last three stanzas. And again, notice the title, Waiting Upon God, and these last three stanzas take care of the last part of the, that psalm. Interestingly, the tune is, that we will be using is entitled Evening Prayer. Let's sing the last three, three, four, and five of 363. Read from the Word of God again as we find it in Psalm 130. Psalm 130. A song of degrees. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Our text this evening is found in Psalm 130, verses 5 through 7. Let's read that again, 5 through 7. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. The Heidelberg Catechism uh, shows to us 
that the experience, the experience of the Christian faith always follows three steps. <clears throat> Familiar steps. The experience of my sin. The experience of forgiveness. The experience of gratitude. If you truly know the experience of sin, if you understand depths, but then, secondly, you understand and experience deliverance, that you're forgiven. The reality of being taken out of that hole out of those depths, delivered from all those fears, that when that becomes a reality, then you don't say or think, oh, good, what's next? The experience of forgiveness of such iniquities always results in a course of life. A change has been made. Dramatic. I've been taken out of all those fears. I've been delivered out of that dungeon. I know that I will not have to go to hell. I will not, and I am not, ever bearing the consequences and the punishment of any of my sins. He took it all. God sees me as perfectly righteous. I am adopted into his family. I'm forgiven. And I have a hope. A hope. And that hope is like an anchor. Those of you who love to fish know that when you hit a good spot, you want that anchor to hold. You don't want to drift from it. We have an anchor. Hebrews tells us that that anchor is fixed in heaven. And the rope from that anchor goes to us. Or if you want to turn it around from our perspective, when we tug on that rope and check if it's fixed, is it solid, then the direction of that rope is to the life that is to come. Now the Catechism says the third experience of a child of God is gratitude. But gratitude in a way of life. The psalmist here says if you truly know what it is to be delivered from such distress, then a part of that gratitude, a part of that change, that way of life that's been traumatically made for you in the knowledge that you are forgiven of all your sins is that you now have a hope. A hope. That hope is on nothing less than that life of living in the everlasting kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. Now, we don't do anything to earn forgiveness. It's all grace. We don't do anything to earn eternal life. It's all grace. We can't make that come more quickly. That kingdom. That glory. 
But the attitude that we have to have as those that have been so forgiven is an attitude of waiting, of hope, of watching. A kind of waiting that is filled with hope. There's, there's a waiting where you just, ugh. We didn't worry about children being taken out of cars when I was a little kid. So my mother would go to the grocery store and invariably she said, now you kids behave. I don't know why she had to say that, but she always did. Kids behave. I'll be right back in a minute. Right. And we had to wait. And that kind of waiting wasn't so anxious because my brothers always disobeyed and they... So we had to wait. We had to wait. But that kind of waiting is not a nice waiting. That's, ugh. The kind of waiting that God wants us to have is another kind. There's another kind of waiting where we're expectant and, and we can't wait for it to take place, for it to be a reality. We want it to come. Well, that's what we've got here. Having been given the assurance of forgiveness, we now are in a posture of expectancy. Sometimes we say to women in certain times of their life, are you expecting? Well, we've got to be careful when we say that, but are you expecting? And when are you expecting? Well, it can be said of all of us. We're expecting. We're an expecting people. We're waiting for the Lord. Let's consider what our text says about that. First of all, consider the expectation. Secondly, we're going to look at the basis. And when we look at the basis, then that basis is in his word. There's where the promises of it come. And also a part of that basis is that in him there is mercy and redemption. So the foundation for our expectation is God's word concerning the promises and God's word concerning his mercy and redemption. And finally, we're going to look at the eagerness and that's the expressed in that sixth verse when it describes waiting as watching, as watching. To wait in hope. When the Bible talks about hope, then it's not something the way we use that word. I sure hope so, when we're not sure whether it's going to happen. We want it to, but we're not positive it's going to. The Bible is exactly the opposite. When the Bible talks about a hope, it has first of all the reality that there is an expectation of something to come. But then it adds to, I want it to come. I'm longing for that, that expectation to be realized. And then thirdly, I know it will. There is a certainty that it will come. So when, you, when, you, when he says hope, let Israel hope, hope is I have an expectation of something to happen. There's, there's something out there that I'm expecting, and I'm longing for it, and I am certain it's going to take place. Now he says about that hope that we wait. I, I hope that, in the wrong kind of way, that now, after the different Psalted numbers we've sung, you've seen the use of the word wait many times in Scripture. That last verse, that beautiful last verse of that beautiful Psalm 27, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. And then he adds, wait, I say, on the Lord. Many of you have the picture of the eagle, Isaiah 40, verse 31. You want to know how to renew your strength? 
how to run and not be weary, walk and not faint. We renew our strength by waiting on the Lord, on Jehovah. Same idea. To wait is to have an expectancy, this expectation that is our hope. But when we add the word wait, then there's this. A patient endurance is added to it. If, if hope consists of there's something I long for and I know will come, then waiting that's added to hope is I can endure the things that have to take place before that expectation is realized. And I can do that patiently. He never fails. I don't have to say, well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. I can be patient because it is certain of being realized. It's a confident expectation. Now, many times the expectation, as I've just described it to you already, is for something that, that will character, be characterized by the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, the establishment of the new heavens and the new earth, and our living with him in glory forever. While that is all true, our text in all of these other verses, Psalm 27, 14, Isaiah 40, verse 31, and many others, make the object, that which we're looking at, that which we're anticipating, God. God. Verse 5, Jehovah. The object of our expectation is not something, but someone. Jehovah. Now again, now let's go back, step back, and look at the whole psalm. The depths, despair, dark. One of the beautiful parts of the Aaronitic blessing, the blessing that God commanded Aaron to give, that I strive to remember to give every Sunday night. You hear, you hear the Aaronitic blessing. And the first Part of that blessing is this. Jehovah bless you and keep you. Jehovah lift up the light of his countenance upon you. Dark despair. We expect, we want, we look for the light of God's face. If we've had experiences with those in authority that we've gotten into trouble and when we walk in in subsequent situations where we meet that authority and then we always, consciously or unconsciously, are looking at their face. We don't want them to see we're looking at their face, but we're very aware. What is their face telling us about what's their attitude towards me now? And we can't wait until we're restored into favor. We want that authoritative figure to look at us pleasantly. We want to know things are okay again. When we're in the depths and we know we deserve his wrath and nothing but wrath, then he teaches us a forgiveness. Then what we are looking for, what we are wanting, is the assurance that his face is shining. So when, when, you, when you hear that Aaronitic blessing, the light of his countenance shine on you, then that's a look on God's face where he looks at you with a smile and his, light just, his face just lightens up 
when he sees you and he lets you know he is pleased to see you. He is really happy to see you. We have that when we greet people, consciously or unconsciously. What do they look like? What's, what's going on in their life? How they greet you? What their face is like when they say hi? The light of the countenance of God. We want that light to shine on us. We want to know that we are in a favorable position with him. That his attitude toward us is one of favor. Grace. We want to know that he's a, a God who hears our prayer and answers. Three times we saw last Sunday night from the first three verses, there's cries. Be attentive to the voice of our supplications. And so when we have an expectation on Jehovah and we're waiting for him, then we want to know whether he's hearing our cries, our prayers, and whether he's in a position of willingness to answer them. We want to know whether he's going to perform the promises that he has made to us. So the focus is not for something, but we're waiting for Jehovah himself. Now ultimately, from the perspective of the psalmist, all of this was going to be realized in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he says, I wait for the Lord, Psalm 27, Isaiah 40, and all the other passages of Scripture in the Old Testament about waiting, they're waiting for the, for the introduction of God's promises about Jesus. They've been waiting for 4,000 years before it was realized. But that's the posture and the position that they have. They're waiting for Christ to come as God promised that he would. Because Jesus, the seed of the woman, the son of David, is the one that would earn the forgiveness for them. And so they're, they're expecting that. Now, in his first coming, what Jesus did is introduce those promises and that favor of God. We, in this dispensation, look for the conclusion of that reality, for the full realization of all of those promises of God. So as they in the old looked for the first, so we in the new look for the second, for him to realize fully. Now we struggle with the old man. Now we've got the devil always plaguing us, poking at us. As we make our travels through this earth, it's hard. Sometimes we have night as well as day. Sometimes here in West Michigan, even our days are horribly cloudy and reasons for discouragement and despair. We want to know the eternal sun, the eternal day. So in the midst of this life, we're still looking for the full realization. We believe he came. We saw his death. But there's more. And so we still are having the same posture our fellow saints of the old dispensation did. We're waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. One other thing about this waiting, and there's two parts to this one other thing. Who wait? Well, I want you to notice that in the text, he points out two things. He says, my soul, and he says, Israel. My soul waiteth. My soul waiteth. I can fool a lot of people with the outside. People only see the outside. That's what God said to Samuel. God sees the inside. The sincerity of his waiting was evidenced when he said, my soul waits. 
And he didn't say a part of my soul, my mind. He didn't say a part of my soul, my will. He said my soul. So that a, my thinking, my, my, my thoughts, and my wants, and my desire to control my emotions, that's all a part of my soul, are all together in this posture of anticipation, of expecting. And again, my soul emphasizes I'm ready to place myself before God. I can, I can say that I am, and a lot of people may think that I am, but God knows. It's, it's, it's like sitting here, and it is possible, I've done it, to sit in a worship service and have my eyes just, I've, I've got it focused. Sometimes, you know, you, I can see because people's eyes are everywhere else, but it's possible to sit and have the eyes focused on the minister and the mind be way off. But it looks good. My soul, my mind and my will, I want and I am anticipating, I am focused. Now, the second part is, while this is so personal, it's not individualistic. And that's the neat part. It's so personal, but it's not individualistic. What is real? We're walking together. When I have this expectation, I not only know that I'm not the only one, but all the others, the saints of old and new together, but then secondly, I know that, that a part of my expectation isn't just for me. You, you can't help but, but think as, as, a, as a child of God who has relative strength and health about other children of God who, who can't be here because age, Parkinson's, bowel issues, so sick you can't even dress up and come to church. And, and your, your thoughts go to the other parts of the body. Because we are a body. It's, it's a nation of Israel, but it's the body of Jesus Christ. There's two reasons why the souls of the saints that are in glory already, not the persecuted ones, the ones that are under the altar in Revelation 6, but all the rest of the souls of the saints are in heaven, are, are, know that what they have is not the full thing yet. One part is they don't have their bodies. But like Moses and Elijah and all of those that were raised when Jesus was raised from the dead, they've got their bodies in heaven. But they still know this isn't it. This isn't the thing. There's more to come. And they're expectant for they're just as expectant as the saints of the, on earth are expectant. They know there's more. Why? Because they, they, they know that the body is not completely there yet. Okay. That is real. This is not only something for me that is very personal, but, it's, but I have that personal thing with many others. And we, the whole of us personally, together, have that kind of an expectation. Come. We're going to wait. We are waiting. We're in the posture of waiting. We don't eat when the bread comes to us. We wait for everybody else. We do it together. Now, 
What's the basis for this expectation and this waiting on Jehovah? First, the last part of 5 says, In his word do I hope. Why would we think? Why would I, who still have yet to do a single thing that's perfect, why would I, who still can fall into some of the most despicable sins, why would I expect that the holy God would want me in glory. What, what could ever be the reason for why I can have that kind of an expectation? I can have a longing for it, but can I really expect it? How do I know that that hope is so certain for somebody who's still has to say the chief of sinners and less than the least. Well, if God didn't say it, then there wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to hope. If we, if we say, well, because I, I'm good enough or because I... Every... Thing that I think I can do, what's right, is going to be offset by far greater more that, than I do wrong. So the, the basis for our expectation and hope is in His Word. In His Word of promise given. God has been pleased to speak. That's his word. And he has spoken unbelievable promises. He not only speaks and says, I love you and I gave my son to die for you. But he adds, I'm going to take you and make you to be jewels in my crown. I want you to adorn my robe. You are going to decorate my kingdom. You are going to be displays of the power of my grace. I promise, I promise. And when God swears, there's nothing greater because he swears by himself. To David, remember how long David had to wait and wait and wait on Jehovah, and he did it. He was not going to get that promised crown by killing Saul. And there he has his best friend saying, do it, get him, and you're king. David said, no, my posture has to be one of waiting for God who made the promise to give it. I'll wait for him. And God gave it. Now think of Psalm 89. The promises that God gave to David when he said to David, No, you may not build me a temple, but I promise that your seed are going to sit upon that throne forever. And though they forsake me, and though they do this that's wrong, and they do that that's wrong, and they do this and that, my word is called the sure mercies of David. The sure mercies of David. God says, I make a promise to you that your children will, and nothing's going to break that. They, no matter how great their sins are, 
cannot break my promise. Can't. Because their sins aren't greater than my grace. My grace is greater than all your sins. Christ came. A seed of the woman. In spite of all the efforts of Cain to kill Abel, of the Satan to kill the seed of the woman, to prevent him coming, Herod, Athaliah, one after another, the constant efforts until finally we may believe if we understand the genealogies correctly, there was no one left but a virgin. And God said, when there's no hope, I'll use when it's hopeless. Abraham was a hundred. Past the age of bearing children, God said, that's when I'll show you so that you will realize on the basis of all my fulfilled promises of the past that you can trust my word of promise given. And it's because with me there is mercy. For with Jehovah the self-sufficient, independent, but also unchanging God, there is mercy. That's right. We say, we're no good. We don't deserve it. God says that that's exactly the people to whom I give mercy. I don't give mercy to those who think they earn it. I don't give mercy to those who think they deserve it. I give mercy to those that are of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. But my mercy is so steady and so fresh. And when God gives mercy, and he gives mercy, and he gives mercy, and it's new, and he gives mercy, and it's new, and he gives mercy, and you look, you step back and you look, mercy, mercy, then you say, great is thy faithfulness. Because faithfulness is repeated mercies. Mercy. With God, with Jehovah, there is mercy. And with Him, when you despair, when you get frustrated, when you're hurting, when you're troubled, with Him, there is not just redemption. But there is plenteous redemption. Plenteous. Plenteous. Consider the number of those that are redeemed that he bought with, the, with his own life's blood. You can't count the sins. You can't count the individuals. You can't count the members of his body. So many. Consider from what we're redeemed. The curse. Condemnation. Death. Hell. Satan. Every enemy. Consider the blessings that are included in redemption. Pardon, regeneration, justification, adoption unto children, sanctification, hope of eternal life. But the nature, the greatest evidence of the plenteous nature of the redemption that's in Jesus Christ is understood when you strive to focus on the price paid to redeem. To redeem a house, we have to get caught up on all the mortgages that are past due. But there's a number. 
There's a limit. Maybe it's out of my reach, but, but there's a limit. There's a certain number. It can be paid. If I bring something because I need money and I go to a pawn shop and then I, got, I get the money back and I go back and I've got to redeem it for an extra price. There's a price tag. The price that God paid is so unfathomable. Nothing less than his own son. The son of God. And that's why our fathers, when they wanted to describe the power of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, they said it this way, the death of the Son of God is the only and most perfect Satisfac sacrifice and satisfaction for sin and is of infinite worth and value, abundantly sufficient to expiate the sins of the whole world. And when we read about the history of the writing of the Canons of Dort, we know that there were some people who came up and they had a motion that they wanted to add, and ten worlds besides! They didn't add it, but they could have. The value, the infinite worth and value of the death of the Son of God that was necessary, but he paid it, was sufficient to expiate the sins of every human. God didn't want it. That's why it didn't happen. But, it, but the, the limited number of the elect is not because the death couldn't cover more. It could have. The next article. This death derives its infinite value and dignity from these considerations because the person who submitted to it was not only really man and perfectly holy, but the only begotten Son of God of the same eternal and infinite essence with the Father and the Holy Spirit, which qualifications were necessary to constitute him a Savior for us. Plinius redemption. If that was the price that he paid, and he makes the promises of the hope of everlasting life, then, beloved people of God, the light of his countenance does shine on you. You may not, I am fond of saying this because it's a great reminder for myself. Do you know the sun's shining? Right now. The sun is shining. There may be things that have gotten in the way but the sun is shining. I just have to go to a place that I can see it, but it's shining. On the cloudiest day, all I have to do is get in a plane and get high enough, and I'll burst out into that sun. It's there. That's his promise. posture of the child of God is not, well, I guess I'll wait. A young person wanted to know, is it wrong to not want Jesus to come back until I get married? Until I have this baby? Until this or that. The posture of the psalmist is this. My hope is fixed. And I watch. My waiting. My waiting. 
is as one who watches for the morning light. They didn't have security cameras and all sorts of things then as we do now. So they had to put people up on walls and in other positions where the enemies might come and they were the watchmen and they would have instruments to awaken the city in case there would be a danger. But they had to stand there and with their eyes they had to watch. But as they watched and they had the night duty and they were up all night, they couldn't wait for morning. The same thing about somebody who's taking care of a, a loved one that's sick. You just sit there and you, and you care for them, and you, but it's so lonely and it's so quiet. And you can't wait for morning light. The nature, the nature of our waiting is always to be a watching. Now that's not only, when is he going to come? When, when you have those parables after Matthew 24 and he gives the signs of the times and every parable ends, watch and pray. The nature of our watching on the part of the child of God is not just for Jesus to come. But it's a posture. It's a life posture. I wake up in the morning and I go to bed at night with a focus. With a focus. In the fifth head, when it describes how it is possible for a child of God who is bought with the blood of Christ to sin and to fall deeply, they, they talk about this watching and praying. I want to I wanna read. The f article 4 of the fifth head. Now, this is the negative side, but it points out the positive. Although the weaknesses of our flesh cannot prevail against the power of God who confirms and preserves true believers in a state of grace, yet converts are not always so influenced and so actuated by the Spirit of God. Not always so influenced and actuated by the Spirit of God that they are not, in some instances, sinfully to deviate from the guidance of divine grace so that they're seduced by and they comply with the lusts of their flesh. Here it is. We fall because we're not attentive enough. But that's not because sin is greater than God's power. They must, therefore, be constant in watching and prayer that they be not led into temptation. So you see, this, this position of watch and pray isn't, I'm, I can't wait for Jesus to come, but it's watching and pray is that I'm alert. I strive to see God in every situation of my life. I'm waiting for Jehovah. The kids this morning were talking about, what if you're judged unfairly? Well, I have learned that, that when we're judged unfairly and, and we're punished for something that we don't deserve, because we deserve a lot, but that time we didn't do it. Somebody else did, but we are being punished. When we endure and bear it cheerfully, then we're following the Lord Jesus Christ who did that all his life. He never was punished for something he deserved. He got all kinds of, of, of wrong charges put on him. But he endured it. And we are to follow his example. The way we do that is this. Jesus knew that God, he, the, 1 Peter 2 says, he committed himself to God who judges righteously. God will fix it. He saw God's hand. So when we are being criticized unfairly, 
to watch and pray is, God's right here. God wanted this to happen to me. God is testing me. See, watching and praying, to be constant in watching and praying is, I'm always aware of God. I see Him. I'm waiting for Him. He's right here. He's working on me. He's shaping and molding me. But God is here. I see God. And I know He loves me. My life may be hard right now. This may be a difficult way. But God is right here. Wait a minute. When he said at the end of Psalm 27, wait on the Lord. Who is that Lord? He was the one who he said about in, Psalm, in the first verse this. The Lord is my light and my salvation and the strength of my life. If we're delivered... We know the reality of distress, but we know the deliverance. And we know his word of promises of mercy and redemption. Then the posture of life that we are going to take, must take, is one of watching and pray, waiting for the Lord. Amen. Our Father, we thank Thee for this powerful reminder that Thou dost give to us. A reminder that we need. We sure do need it a lot. Over and over. So gracious God, we thank Thee for it. Keep working on us. Help us by Thy Spirit to watch and pray. To be constant in watching and praying. Amen. Psalter number 162. 162. Taken from Psalm 62. Notice again the title, God our strength, God our strength, why not wait on him? My soul in silence waits for God my Savior he has proved. Let's sing the two stanzas of 162.
Jehovah bless you and keep you. Jehovah make his face to shine upon you. Jehovah lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.